Shelly Plum today to talk about physical fitness. In specifically, we're going to talk about Pilates. You know, it was funny. This weekend, I was at a swim meet with my daughter, and we were up at five in the morning. And I'll tell you what, I was inspired by her because her passion for physical fitness and her sport was just second to none. And I wondered. I mean, I'm dragging myself out of bed this morning, wondering when I'm going to do my my morning walk and my my exercise. When do we lose that passion, or do all of us lose that passion for physical fitness? So we have a treat today. We have a Pilates instructor that is so ingrained in the South Florida community. She has an amazing reputation, Charlie Touch. Now Charlie is a Pilates instructor, and we're going to learn all about what Pilates can do for our mind, our body, and our spirit. How are you, Charlie? I'm very happy to be here. And now, Charlie, you are a Pilates instructor, and I will be honest, I have not done Pilates before. How did you get into Pilates? Well, Pilates came to me, and I started to get requests for doing Pilates from members of my community, members of my gym, and they had all different needs, whether it was flexibility or strength, or parts that were stiff, or a lot of times these days you have a lot of um, clinicians that are recommending Pilates for people with back complaints or you know joint injuries. It seems to be sort of a post rehab thing. So I love the fact that people like you come to me with no previous Pilates experience because a lot of what I do has to be born sort of organically. There aren't a lot of classic type Pilates exercises that you're ever going to see me teach to my students. Is so, that right? So, oh, yes. Yeah. In fact, I taught a class the other day, and some of the students who had never taken my class before walked out and said, hey, you didn't do that hundreds. You didn't do the rolling like the ball. Why didn't you? And I said, well, I have to look at my audience, and right. then I have to see are these exercises going to benefit them? Are they going to be productive to them? Is it going to make them stand up better? Are they going to leave feeling taller? Are they going to leave feeling, you know, wheel greased and super glued back together? And sometimes I have to edit the content of those movements and give them maybe the step down, the progression that'll get them there. Like I'm the gateway drug right. to some of these sexier moves because you have to start from somewhere and people have to know that they have the tools to get there. So, so as it say, so what I'm hearing from you is when you teach a class, not everyone is taught the same way. Absolutely Everyone not. has a different experience, a different need that, and, and I have, my hat is off to you because you really have to be very intuitive that way uh, to, to see where, where people are maybe struggling or their wants and their needs and really adjust the program for them. Am, am I correct in saying well, that? Well, I would love to think that I am intuitive, but I think that might be giving me more credit than I'm, than I'm due. <laughs> I think you're too. I, I, I just, I happen to be very, um, you know, I'm a people person, so when people come into the room, I don't just let them line up on a mat and get down on the floor and start going. I, right. I try to chat it up with them. In fact, every class I teach, I encourage my students, so what's going on with you today? What do we got to do? Right. You know, I, I tell them, like, you know, I came in totally unprepared today. Will you tell me what it is I'm going to teach? Because I really don't know. <laughs> um, and everybody's always got a little something, something going on. Right. And so... The thing is, even though we're all different, we're all the same. Compression is how we are, you know, working against gravity every day. Yes. So I don't know what world you live in, but gravity is affecting us all. So most of the injuries that I see, most of the compromise that students come in with, scoliosis, stenosis, herniations, bulgings, plantar fasciitis, whatever it is, unpacking everybody, decompressing everybody works for everybody. And there's a way to do it that I can give to you and to the person next to you and to the person next to you that makes sense in your body. Right. You know, I always say, I'm going to give you 10 different options, bite off the pieces you can chew, and leave the rest behind. That's good. Right? I, I lay it out like an a la carte menu. Take right. the parts you like and skip the rest. Right. Because there's going to be another opportunity to come back for more. I hope. You know, because I have been, not necessarily in Pilates class, because I've never done Pilates before, but in other exercise classes where we were all lumped together and we were all asked to do different exercises. And quite frankly, there were some that I couldn't do. And it made me feel defeated in a way. How does the way you teach, where you analyze everyone's uh, needs, how does that set people up for success? Oh my gosh, there's just so much that wants to come out of my brain okay, right now to answer right. that question. Okay, all right, we want to hear it all, we want to hear it all. Well, let me start by saying that group fitness class of any variety, of any kind, they're designed to get a lot of people in one time slot 
to be able to achieve a fitness goal. So whether it's flexibility class or a cardio class or a dance class, whatever the class may be. You know, the premise is great because people only have so much time and they want to get it done and they want to be led. Right. A lot of us would rather be told what to do than try to figure it out on our own, especially if you come to it with no knowledge of how to move your body. So you're relying on somebody to help you get there. And, and, and by that premise, it's awesome because the statistics show that people who come to group fitness class come three times a week more to a gym than people who don't. So the problem lies that once you get into those classes, a lot of the teachers and instructors, they've trained within the modality that they've learned, whether it's the Zumba dance or the strength class. And you can't learn everything you need to know about a body in those courses that you take. None of us can. I'm continually going back to class. I have a workshop coming up with a spine guy in February because everybody is different and everybody needs to be addressed and you just can't do it very well in a group environment. True. Because I spend so much time one-on-one -on -one with folks because I get to gain um, the hours, the time spent watching movement. I literally have a data collection of how body parts move and work and walk and talk so I can bring it to a group fitness class and present it in a way that everybody can take it. I would say I'm damage control. I'm really good at damage control, right? If something's broken, I'm your go-to girl because I'm not going to panic. I'm just right. going to try to figure out in a calm manner how to distribute the information that you need to get us past the hurdle that you're on. Right. And if I don't understand it, I'm going to go try to figure it out. I'm going to go talk to somebody that knows. I'm going to go look for the answers. So that way people, if they get frustrated, and they are, so many people are so frustrated, Shelly. It's so sad. There's so many people in pain. There's so many people that are broken. People present to me every day, and you know what their, their going phrase is? What is the going phrase? Okay, these are my issues. Oh, really? These are the parts of me that are bad. And it drives me crazy. Oh, my goodness. But it's true, right? Yeah, that's, right. I know that this, I know I've got a bad shoulder. Right. I know I've got a bad hip. So I have to start, when you ask about the mind-body piece, I work more on minds than I do on muscles. I okay, really so do. let's talk about that. Because a lot of people that I have encountered are viewers that are out there. They think of Pilates and they think of physical fitness. But Pilates, from what I have been looking on uh, online and looking at what you do, it is so much more. So the mind, I am fascinated because for something, anything in our life to be successful, the mind has to be in alignment. Uh, so how does Pilates affect the mind? Well, first of all, you have to have one, and I think most of us feel like we've lost ours okay. most of the time, <laughs> right? So sometimes it's just a matter of getting, getting someone in the room and listening to what they have to say. Sure. Because I think a lot of times people just get told what to do without ever having any sort of, you know, what your needs are, what's your input, um, what are you looking to do? So when I have a body in front of me, I need to figure out what it is they like, what it is they want to do. Right and what's keeping them from doing it. Because then, if you can attach a successful movement to what it is they would like to do, their mind lights up. It's like crack for your brain. You yes. know, people say to me all the time, I, for example, I, I, you know, I had a knee surgery or I have a bad knee. Right. I can't lunge or squat, okay. for example. And I'll say, how do you go to the bathroom? Uh -huh. I mean, sure. I mean, unless you're doing it standing up. Yes. Chances are we got to squat down a couple times a day. Right. So if I can attach it to something that makes sense to them, right. their mind changes around the approach. And, and then we're in, right? Yes. They have to feel like people think they, we have this horrible sort of um, default setting that it's okay if it hurts a little bit. You right. know, I have this thing with my back, but it's fine. I'm like, no, no that's it's not it's fine. So, so that brings up a good point because, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a physician, and I see people, even though I treat from the knee down, people come with all types of ailments. And I see that all the time. And what I do is, you know what, I have this little crick in my neck, but it's fine. You know what, I've had it for years. You know what, I just deal with it, and I go about, on about my life. But what you're saying is it doesn't have to be that way. We are so far removed from being attached to the communication system that is our body. Pain is supposed to be a signal. You know, your knee can't open up its Siri voice box and say, hey, I'm pulling, I'm tender, you know, right. do something different. So it gives you pain or it gives you a signal. And sometimes if we just start to pay attention to what the signals are, we can find a strategy around correcting it. Right. But people are so used to sort of numbing some of these things. Um, 
you know, and there's a shot for everything, and there's a pill for everything. Sure, yeah. And I can't tell you how many people have had surgeries for just about everything. And, and I understand when intervention is necessary, I so get it. But sometimes people don't understand there's a choice. Right. And letting them know that it, it hurts when you do that, but what if we do this? How does that feel? Right. And for them to pay attention to it, they're like, oh, well, I, it doesn't hurt when I do that. Okay, let's go with that, right? Right. I think they're so shocked that they can be pain-free. It's the most exciting thing right. when you tell somebody, you know, you don't have to hurt. No, it's okay. I'm used to it. It's like, when did we get so married no, to no. this idea that everything yeah. has to hurt? So it's fun for me. I spend every day going, no, you don't have to hurt. You it don't does, have to It hurt. doesn't have to hurt. Um, you know, in fact, there are tremendous coaches. There's a Russian Olympic coach named Pavel, who I, I quote all the time. I love, love, love him. He's hired by the U.S. Department of Defense. He works for the Marine Corps. The Secret Service hires him. And, and I can't remember what his title is, but he, he's a movement coach. And he says, strength training should feel good. When you're done, it should feel good. And the reason is, which brings me back to your original yes. question, it's neural. Right. The mind component for me isn't a woo-woo feel good thing, there's actual science and physiology that happens right. when you feel good about a movement that makes you able to be more successful. So if you're sort of living under that, that, that realm of it's got to hurt in order for it to work, you're really sabotaging yourself right. because you can't get stronger that way. You can't get better. You can't perform better. Right. So if it feels good, uh -huh. you should keep doing it. Uh, absolutely. So you know what? That kind of links two things, the mind with the body and when you get them in alignment I mean you're setting yourself up for success so I'm curious with Pilates let's talk about the body and pain for example now how does Pilates decrease pain does it strengthen certain muscle groups let's take back pain for example just as an example how does Pilates affect back pain it's the best example because it's the most prolific. 99.9% yes, yes. .9 of my clients come in with back pain. So Pilates looks at the whole picture. And it, in, in all due respect, any fitness venue should look at the whole picture. But Pilates, Joseph himself, you know, he always said, he wrote in one of his books, if the entire United Nations could do my exercises, we would have world peace. Because he didn't just look at one exercise. You know, if you come in and your back bothers you, I'm going to make, make you stand up. I'm going to make you walk. I'm going to look at the whole picture. Because a lot of times the pain isn't because it's right there. Right. It's because of something is falling on it. I tell my clients, have you ever seen a teepee, the mm -hmm. old Indian-style yes. Native American right. teepee? There's a tent pole up the middle. Well, it's kind of like your spine. Your spine's not in the middle, but your spine is the support structure, right, for the canvas, like a teepee tent. And that teepee, that canvas is pulled tight with ropes. You can kind of picture them going right, all the way around. Right. Well, when people present like back pain, I describe to them, it's like, it's like you took a couple of those cords and you cut them on one side. What happens to the TP? Right? It starts yeah, to lean. Right. And then I ask him, I say, well, is the pain where I cut the cord? What do you think? What do you think, uh, Shelly? Is the pain where I cut the cord? No, no. Where's yeah. the pain? On the other side where it's under a lot of strain. It's where the other mechanisms yes. are desperately trying to hold you up. And the body is a series of pulleys. Like, I see you like architecture now. I right. see your bones. And your body is basically just 24-7 managing postures, loads. Um, and, and if you understand how to balance those postures and loads appropriately for the structures mm -hmm. yes. as they were designed, you can begin to resolve pain because generally pain is because something isn't holding up its end of the deal. I understand. Right? I always say, everybody, you're, you're like a car. There, in so many ways, it's a great analogy because the more mileage you put on that car, right, the more worn out it's going to get. I think I remember somebody saying to me once that in physiology, you're designed for 60 years of hard use. Yes. So imagine whatever it is you've done to your body and whatever you've done to your body, they're all very different. So you either start to fall apart before 60 or at 60 the wheels kind of start to fall off. When you have back pain, it's sort of telling you like one of the wheels, one of the tire treads has gone down, you're kind of riding on the axle. Right. You've got to put the whole car back in alignment in order for it to stay rolling right, right. down the road. And that's my approach to muscles and bones and structures. Strength progression is very easy to teach, right? You start with something small, you successfully are able to lift it, not more than five times. Yes. 
in order for it to be a strength endeavor. And then you're able to progressively move on to the next bit of posture and load. Right. Back pain and, and muscular training for me go together in that if your back hurts when you're doing whatever it is the movement is you're doing, we're not doing it right. Yes. So there's some muscle, there's some alignment, there's some you know, structural place that you could be better and not hurt. Right. And so that's how we treat muscles and bones, right? Muscles move bones. People forget or don't know, right, that muscles pull bones, right? They don't pull, they don't push, they only pull. So your whole body is a series of pulleys. And once you begin to, you know, educate a person on right. the idea that a lot of back pain comes posturally from defaulting into forward head carriage and rounded shoulders, the pulley system back there, those back muscles, they're being overstressed, they're being overworked, they want to go this way. And so we start to sort of train the muscles to balance each other out right. so that optimally that TP is just resting very efficiently around the pole. Right? I like that because, I mean, I mean, just knowing about anatomy, uh, you know, with back pain, it could have a lot to do with not just your back muscles, but your abdominals and, and you know, your, your trapezius muscles, a lot of things go into, because there's a lot of pulleys within yeah. the human body, am I right? Yes, and, and I have to say, since you mentioned abdominals, because that's everybody's sort of go-to move, and a lot of physical therapy, um, uh, when people are post, -re when they're treating um, different pathologies and, and orthopedic conditions, um, core is a word that's thrown around, and people do think abdominals, and that's sort of your go-to thing. But one of the things I love to tell everybody, you know, is that if you think about just abdominals being this right here, the rectus abdominis, I had a teacher who called it the minute steak. It's very thin, and all it does is do this. Right. So imagine what that looks like done over time. It's not really the go-to move right. to fix anybody, right? The idea is that all, and they're called transverse abdominis, there's my big words for you. Uh, I, to, me, to me, I call it the this. The take home word today is transverse, transverse abdominus. Transverse It's more like a bulletproof vest. It's like a corset. It is. It's an anatomical yes. corset that goes all around you and it holds you up. But even still, those are sort of go-to catchphrases in, in Pilates and in core training. And I really think that as important as they are, you have to look at the whole, I deal with the spine and the pelvis yes. primarily. Right. Because most people don't understand there's, you know, it's 24 bones, 22 discs, and they're sitting in the cradle of the pelvis. If those things aren't in the right spot at the right time, your fingernails are affected because your hair follicles are attached to right. your spine. Inevitably, everything goes back to your spine. So yes, those abdominals that you talk about, they're important, but they're only a small piece of the puzzle. Yes. And so when you start to look at the whole person, then you don't have to concentrate on spot welding here mm -hmm. or here. It's really easy to tell somebody, for example, if you seriously walk around like you have a book on your head all day long and you're trying to balance it, you're working muscles. Yes. Because you're resistance training against gravity, right? right. Gravity's yes. doing this, and any time I do like this, I have muscles that are acting, pulling my spine apart to hold me up. So as silly as it sounds, it's actually worth doing because nobody knows you're doing it. It doesn't cost you anything. Right. And it kind of looks, you know, like very, you know, you know, like very cool, very royal, love me. Right. But it's those kind of things. I try to give behaviors that people can do all day. Pilates isn't something I go to do every day. It's something that I do all day long every day, especially like for people that are working. For example, Pilates to me is if you know you have to be sitting in a chair all day, yeah. come sit on the edge. Make your pelvis stack up this way. Right. Right. As opposed to being here. We sit on L3 and L4 all day long sometimes, some people, depending on driving, depending on fitness. They were telling us for years, and, and I was an offender of it, you know, sink into your low back. We, remember, you've heard yes, this in a yes. class. Uh -huh. Press that low back into the floor. Preserve those curves in your back, right. girl. That's what I tell everybody now. Muscle up around those natural curves in your back. You can picture what they look like. Right. And I tell everybody, a posture, a Pilates posture exercise is imagine if you were being photographed all day in profile. And these days everybody is photographed all the time. I mean, we're always taking yes, pictures true. and being Very taken true. pictures of, yes. right? So I say to everybody, run it through your common sense filter. If you were being photographed in profile, how would you want it to look? And it's amazing. Those are muscles. I'm using muscles that a lot of times I'm not using if I'm not considering it. And so just something as simple as that. There was a great thing I learned from listening to the closure of Downton Abbey. They had hired a barrister because all of the actors had to learn how to posture themselves because it's a very time-specific 
behavioral specific. They had to bring the cups to their face. Right. They have to bring the food to their mouth. And for us especially, one of the things I loved is, does the back of your neck touch your collar? So as you walk around all day and you're trying to think, how can I do my Pilates? How can I fix my back? Seek out the collar with the back of your neck. That's a great point. It's yeah. amazing. I mean, we don't even have to be in a class to you be do doing not. something like that. You do that. not. I always yes. tell everybody, listen, it doesn't have to cost you any money. You don't need any equipment. Uh -huh. You don't have to go anywhere to do it. Once you understand what these structures are supposed to look like and how they're supposed to hold you up, you don't need anybody to teach you anymore. You'll do it all the time. Right. And thank God, because I spend a lot of time just running my mouth all day. I don't always have time to stop and do but I'm always doing it. Yes, yes. Do you know what I mean? So. Well, you have to make it almost like a habit. And um, Well, there's the neural component. You talk yes, about mind. Yes, right. So when you talk about making a habit, people are back there going, oh, my God, Another i got to learn to do one more yeah. thing. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't stick to anything. How long is this going to take me? So when people come to see me, that's what I tell them they're paying me for, right? You're paying me so that I'm going to become that earworm in your brain. Right. I'm going to infect your head so every time you're at a red light, you're going to seek out the back of your headrest, the headrest on your car with the back of your head behind your nose, not your eyeballs. Right? So instead of being here, you ever look at the girl driving beside you? you know, right. she, I call it the toilet sit. Right? <laughs> but every once in a while, if you think the of my voice sit. in your head, yes. you'll, the back of your head behind your nose. And it won't last but a few seconds, Shelly. Right. But if I happen to think about it during five red lights, uh -huh. that's 30 seconds of Pilates I did today. And incrementally, you'll start doing those things longer and longer if I can sort of give you something that feels doable. I think that's why people like me. You know, doable, but also feels good. Because yes. we are more likely not to think of something as a habit, but to think of it something as, you know, necessary for our health. If it feels good, we're going to do more of it. And uh, yes. so that makes a lot of sense. Now, I have a question. I have a friend who does Pilates. And every time she comes back from her class, I am struck by how incredibly relaxed she looks. So comment on Pilates with regards to your spirit. How does it, how does it affect your spirit personally? You know what? That's my favorite, favorite part. Yes. It really is. Because when I get people into a class or into my studio, I just feel like I'm throwing the party. I want them to come to a great party. Yes. Because it's for them. You know, when you talked about people that go to a class and they feel defeated, it breaks my heart because mm. a teacher in a class is supposed to be for them. Yes. So every time somebody comes to me, I'm there for them. I want to service you like nobody's business. I am that girl. I am the bartender for your Pilates practice today. And I want you to leave with a good posture hangover like right. nobody's there business. There you go. I like that. So the mind part of it is you can't, it can't be like watching paint dry. So the approach I take, the delivery I think I have that, that, that has, you know, garnished me a few students and friends along the way is the fact that it has to be appropriate and available to you, right? right yes. You know, most of my students, they're not training for the Nutcracker Ballet this season. Right. And once I tell them, you know, you don't have to make those, if you could straighten your legs, you probably wouldn't need me. <laughs> Everybody feels better. And then that makes it more available to them, right? right? You have to feel like, right, if you're going somewhere, you have to, you're going there because you want to go there. If people have to come to my class and it's work and it's something they don't want to do, they're certainly not going to leave with anything in their pocket. But during class, we have a little laugh because they can relax a little bit. Um, efficient movement means it's effortless, right? Right. It's not like carrying the 50-pound dumbbells when you're, you know, there's a lot of effort involved in there and you put them down and you can sort of feel exhausted and broken. Um, your day makes you feel like that. Pilates, I would say, should be sort of the, the reboot, the restore right. in that. I want to, when they come in, I'm like, we're going to grease your wheels, we're going to super glue all your parts back together. And that instantly appeals to everybody because who doesn't want that? Right. Right? Yes. So I think it's the language that I speak. I think, you know, knowing that every human is different but relatively the same, we all want to feel like we're taller when we walk. I've never met anybody that said they wanted to get shorter. And I would say I've never met a woman. Well, I will tell you, I don't want to be shorter. Exactly. <laughs> I never met anybody who said they wanted to be shorter. They all want to be taller. Uh -huh. And I think one of the best um, evaluations I had after doing a workshop was one of my students walked out and she goes, you know, when, when, I, when I do a lot of my stuff, I really feel like it, 
it's just kind of exhausting, like just holding my arms and my shoulders. It's just so much work. She goes, all of a sudden I just, it doesn't feel like it's work to stand here. Yeah. And Joseph Pilates said that endlessly in his work. It should be effortless. It should be efficient. Joseph even says in his book, which I love, he says, you Americans, you move 10 things when you only needed to move one. Ah. So the mind approach for me is let's work smarter, not harder. That right. way we don't have to do it for as long, and we can go have margaritas somewhere afterwards. Right. That's, I think, where the mind component comes in. Neurology is huge. You have to retrain behavior over and over and over again. But I like to say that it's not just practice that makes perfect, right? Because if you're familiar with golf, you can go have a really crappy golf swing over and over again. It's still going to be crappy. That's true. It has to be perfect practice. So when somebody knows how to stack themselves up the way it should be and they continue to do it, they won't have to think about it anymore. Right. It just happens. And once you can deliver that information to somebody in a way they understand, their mind lights up. Oh, that's true. And they keep coming back, even though I tell them, I'll teach you everything I, I, I'll teach you everything I know right. in a week, and right. then you don't need me. You can just come back for the entertainment. The, the that's entertainment. What that's what the I love. The Pilates because party. it has to It's be just a Pilates fun. party. Oh, it my God, the first fun. time I did Pilates, uh -huh. I was so annoyed. You like, it was you? annoying. It was uh -huh. like 20 years ago, and one of my greatest girlfriends was teaching and opening a studio. Uh -huh. And I loved her, and I wanted to support her. But she put me on this machine, which was weird, and she kept telling me where to put my tailbone. And I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And she didn't have enough experience at the time to be able to translate. I, that's why I say I'm like the Rosetta Stone of movement. Right. I'm not going to tell you a lot of times anatomically where you're supposed to be. I'm going to relate it to something you understand. Yes. And running it through your, your posture filter has been a big one for me. So, you know, one of the things as a takeaway for everybody, if you just walk around going, what does it look like if I were to be photographed? And chances are you'll change something. Right? right? And so those kinds of things, I think, are the most important. So Pilates isn't, it's not dance moves, it's not a girly stretch class. It's got to be something that makes me feel better all day long, every day. And I don't have to think about it to do it. Yes. Yeah. That, that Again, that sets people up for success. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, Charlie, for joining us. I, I'll tell you what, I have learned so much, and I honestly can't wait to experience one of your classes. So if you, for our viewers that are out there, that are, you know, wondering, what, what take-home tips would you give them? So the idea of knowing how tall you are and then imagining yourself being that much taller is yes. great. The stuff we did on the chairs, the idea of planking, although it might sound a little intimidating, just the idea of leaning your spine into things, whether it's the wall or a chair, while you have to brace yourself and your height is a strength endeavor that really affects how well your back behaves. Your back isn't supposed to be flexed and folded all the time. If it was, we could be like this all day and it wouldn't create injury. So if you've got stretches that you're doing that sort of fold you up when you hurt, get rid of them. And that's not my opinion. Okay. That's the opinion of sure. science and the studies that shows the consequence to the disc and the structures. So you don't have to take my word for that. But anything that pulls you up, that lifts you up, and muscularly you have to stay lifted is going to be some of the best stuff you can do, just even as we sit on the chair sitting here versus sinking into the back of the chair, for example, is a great strength exercise that for somebody true. who's spending a ton of time in a chair. Right. So straightening your arms, I can't tell you, literally check out people's arms, ask them to straighten their arm, ask them to hold an arm up, and what you'll see is oftentimes a lot of this, and it's because all of this is pulled so tight from what we have to do every day. So I tell people, walk through doorways, spread your wings, yes. hold onto the door frames and lean in for a minute, contract uh -huh. for a couple seconds, feel, it feels so good generally. You can even move your head while you do it, and then you just keep walking through the doorway like, I meant to do that. And nobody will even know that that was you creating better posture and supporting the structures that we hope will hold you up for the rest right. of your life. Right, right. Um, that, that whole idea of, of just being however tall you are, I can't stress it enough. Yes, that's a good take home tip. And the other take home tip I think that's really important too is people come to me, like you said, with necks and, and shoulder issues mm -hmm. all the time. Yes. Check out that bag you're hanging off your shoulder. Oh my goodness, you saw what I walked in with. Look right now, <laughs> whatever it is that you slung over your shoulder, because people will come to me all the time and be like, you know, I can't do this exercise, I had my MRI, I have bulgings and herniations, so I'm not gonna lift my arm over my head. And I'm like, you're carrying a bag that weighs 20 pounds. Right. And every time you hang it over your shoulder, the behavior that happens underneath that, whether you realize it or not, is this. So 
these are the things we want to eliminate because you're not designed to be like that all day and it's creating consequence, right? right? So things like that I think are important. Check out what you're doing all day long every day. Cell phones, computers. I tell everybody, bring the cell phone to your face. Don't use your neck to look at your technology. Use your eyes. It's a big difference because even now, starting very, very young, we're seeing the anatomy of our next generations folding over. It's terrible. So if you know that this is a behavior that you have going on that you do several times a day, picture yourself bringing it up to you. Right, right. right. Huge, huge, huge. Yeah, that makes a big difference. It makes a big difference because right. people will say, oh, it was that golf game. It just wrecked me. I'm like, really? It wasn't mm. the fact that you spent 20 hours at the computer before you went? Right. So things like that I think are really easy you know, and critical. Oh, it is critical. So, I mean, for viewers out there that are seeing this program today and they are And they're looking at it on their technology. Yes, Hold it up. Hold it up, people. They, right, exactly. If they want to know more, where can they contact you? So stretchmecharlie.com is my website. Yes. Um, all of my contact information is on there. My classes are always advertised on there. I work locally at the PGA National Resort Sports and Racquet Club, um, 400 Avenue of the Champions. And I work in Stewart at ZT's Fitness Studio. I do a, a monthly class there. Um, I also am in tradition in Port St. Lucie, which is my backyard. Oh, so that's good. So my neighbors are seeing this on Thursday nights at 6.30 at Chick Fitness. We will be doing stretch and core class. And I'm available 24-7 through all methods of technology. So even if you can't get to a class, there's stuff I could tell you over the phone right, that yeah. I think that would be extraordinarily helpful if you're suffering or if you need to know. And if I don't know the answer, I'll go find it for you. Right. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of the entire Plum Talk team, I'd like to thank you for joining us. We had a wonderful time. We did. We are very thankful for Plum Talk right oh. back at you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank oh. you.